Thank you for joining us. My name is Dmitry Batsev, and I'm part of the global research platform here at Lazard, focusing on North America financials. I'm joined by my colleague, Catalina Araja, who also is a research analyst on our financials team. Today, we will be discussing the current landscape for U.S. banks. We will take a look at the health of the U.S. banking industry relative to the 2008 global financial crisis. And finally, we will provide our outlook for the sector. So far in 2020, the U.S. bank stocks have underperformed the market in a meaningful way. Through mid-August, the S&P 500 bank stocks are down about 30%, compared to the S&P 500 rising 6%. The U.S. and global economies are under stress triggered by the spread of COVID-19, with memories of the great financial crisis of 2007-2008 still fresh in the minds of investors, many are naturally asking questions about what the current recession means for the U.S. banks and whether the system can weather another storm. On this slide, we draw comparisons between the health of the U.S. banking system prior to heading into the COVID-19 triggered recession and the period leading up to the great financial crisis. There are a number of differences between the two periods, but we would draw your attention to two key themes, leverage and liquidity. There is no question that the biggest change that took place since the GFC is that the amount of capital in the banking system has increased substantially, thanks to regulation. Balance sheet leverage measured as tangible assets divided by tangible equity, stood at 30 times for the top 25 banks at the end of 2007, right before the markets dislocated in 2008. Since then, and through the end of last year, financial leverage came down to 14 times. The chart on the right shows the starting point of where capital and credit reserves stood relative to the ultimate credit losses in the GFC for the systemically important financial institutions, CIFIs. We compare that to where capital is today relative to potential losses that would need to be absorbed in the current recession. To clarify, losses during the GFC shown on the chart are the actual net charge-offs, and the loss expectations for the current recession are from the Fed's annual stress test. We think that using the Fed's loss assumptions is a reasonable estimate of severe stress due to macro shock assumptions used to calculate these losses. In short, the starting point of loss absorbing capital is more than two times that of the 2007 period, and the loss expectations for the current recession are less than the actual experience of the GFC. On liquidity, both sides of the balance sheet have improved as well. Core deposit base, which is the most valuable part of the funding mix due to lower cost and higher stability, has gone up from 59% of total funding at the end of 2007 to 80% at the end of 2019. And on the asset side of the balance sheet, cash and cash equivalents represent over a quarter of total assets today versus less than 14% in 2007. One other noteworthy change that took place in the industry following the crisis of 2007 and 2008 is the de-risking of bank balance sheets and the overall slower balance sheet growth. This slide shows that corporate bank debt has shrunk as percentage of total corporate borrowings from over 14% in 2007 to 11.4% in 2019. Since the GFC, corporate debt has grown at a compounded annual growth rate of 5%, while the bank loan portion of that has grown at 3%. So the banking industry has been ceding market share to other lending sources, including the public markets. Another measure of corporate credit risk is the balance sheet exposure to syndicated lending which tends to exhibit higher losses in periods of stress. In 2007, exposure to syndicated loans relative to total commercial lending 
stood at 27% versus 20% at the end of 2019. We've also heard anecdotal evidence of tighter underwriting in areas such as commercial construction lending, where the banks have been requiring developers to maintain higher equity in projects. This slide shows evidence of de-risking in the consumer credit portfolio. Regulation increased capital charges for the higher credit cost subprime assets. In response, the industry reduced exposure to subprime. Subprime borrowers are generally individuals with FICO scores less than 660. As you can see from the chart, percentage of subprime credit card loans for the top five U.S. card issuers has been shrinking steadily from about 25% 10 years ago to 15% today. Same with consumer real estate. The chart on the bottom shows the change in projected losses for first lien mortgages and home equity loans for every stress testing cycle since the Fed launched this exercise in 2012. Cumulative losses on pools of mortgage loans for the top banks in 2013 were expected to be 6.5%. As of the most recent stress test, these projections were reduced to 1.5%. This is a reflection of reduced risk, including shedding of the legacy subprime assets and lower loan-to-value ratios. Given that the U.S. banks have entered this crisis with strong capital and liquidity, we see the industry this time around as being part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. One area that we have been tracking very closely is forbearance. Payment forbearance is not a novel concept to lenders. Hardship programs have been in place for borrowers and are commonly used in geographies affected by natural disasters such as hurricanes, floods, or wildfires, which can force businesses to close temporarily and economic activity to slow down. In those instances, it is common for the banks to provide temporary payment relief. Under the CARES Act, borrowers could request to enter the hardship program and suspend loan payments or to modify the loan. Depending on the type of loan, payment deferral could last one month like in the case of credit card payments or as long as six months when it comes to mortgages. Most of the programs have been set up for 90 days, with many loans going back into repayment in July, but this could be extended for an additional 90 days. For accounting purposes, loans are not treated as delinquent while they're in forbearance. This is why we have not seen non-performing assets and delinquencies in the industry spike despite a meaningful contraction in the economy and materially higher unemployment rate. Forbearance trends, however, give us a reading to what percentage of the portfolio might be under pressure in the future. On this slide, we see the percent of accounts in forbearance according to the credit score company TransUnion. Forbearance for mortgages, auto, and other personal loans were around 7% as of June, while for credit cards was around 3.5%. Timely disclosure from the banks has been good. Many lenders have commented that a large percentage of customers requested forbearance out of caution. Banks have also reported a material drop of 90% plus in requests from April's peak, and that a significant portion of borrowers have made at least one payment during this time frame. Government stimulus, unemployment benefits, and more limited spending have helped overall conditions of the consumers. On the commercial front, forbearance tends to be more on a case-by-case basis. Nonetheless, there are areas where loan modifications are high, and not surprisingly, are tied to highly impacted COVID industries, such as hotels, restaurants, retail, and entertainment, where stay-at-home mandates simply disrupted the business model. Another area where banks have played a big role in supporting the economy so far during this COVID-19 crisis is by extending commercial credit to both the large corporates as well as to small businesses under the Payment Protection Program, or PPP. Drawing down on revolvers was mostly a Q1 event. Companies were shoring up cash. While this was positive for the banks, because it drove strong period and loan growth in Q1, the important thing to highlight here was that banks were able to fund these revolvers mainly with deposits and with minimal impact on liquidity and capital ratios. 
Most of these lines have now been paid off and in many cases replaced by new debt issuance. On the Payment Protection Program, banks were able to start taking online applications shortly after the program went live. The PPP loans provide businesses another cheap source of funding with an interest rate of 1%, mainly to cover payroll. If cash is deployed as mandated, this cash becomes a grant and businesses can request loan forgiveness. While we haven't seen significant credit events yet, loan losses are likely to rise in the future as hardship programs expired. The good news is that banks have been setting aside money for future loan losses much earlier than in prior cycles. This crisis coincided with the implementation of a new accounting standard called Current Expected Credit Losses, or CECL. CECL requires banks to book p loan loss provisions upfront for the life of the loan portfolio based on current economic assumptions. In contrast, the prior incurred loss model allowed the banks to book losses over the time that they occur. In practical terms, what CECL means is that the banks were forced to already set aside significant reserves for potential losses based on severely stressed macroeconomic assumptions, where in the past, the industry was often accused of being very late to recognize problems. Because of CECL, we think it is quite possible that Q2 marks the earnings trough for the industry in this recession. The CECL model is highly sensitive to unemployment and GDP, as well as loan mix and historical losses of the portfolio. During this unprecedented crisis, the economic outlook shifted quickly, resulting in large reserve builds due to the spike in unemployment and dramatic drop in GDP. As of Q2, U.S. commercial banks have reserved for 2.2% of loans, while net charge-offs total only 56 basis points of loans. In just two quarters, banks were able to build significant reserves, especially when compared to the 300 basis points plus peak in the great financial crisis, while the system stayed profitable. When looking at the reserves by product, a few categories stand out. Banks were quick to build reserves for credit cards, oil and gas portfolios, and COVID-impacted industries such as hospitality and retail. Real estate exposure remains an area of concern, in particular exposure to retail. Long term, we worry about the potential structural changes in the workforce of the future and what happens to office space and migration out of city centers. Certainly, loan mix and diversification matters. On this slide, we show commercial real estate concentration by bank size. The largest banks, those with more than $250 billion in assets, from JP Morgan all the way down to PNC, have the least exposure to commercial real estate as a percent of total assets, close to 5%. As you go down in size, concentration in real estate increases. We think there is less visibility in this asset class and credit loss scenarios are wider. Also, it is important to highlight that smaller banks have less revenue diversification when compared to large banks. 70 to 80% of revenues come from spread income. That is, the difference of what they earn on loans versus what they pay on deposits. And in a zero rate environment, the backdrop for smaller banks is therefore a lot more challenging. In summary, the US banks are significantly better prepared to withstand the current crisis. Post the great financial crisis, regulation ensure that the financial system holds more capital and is more liquid. This is precisely why banks have been doing their part in helping commercial clients as well as consumers by extending credit, modifying loans, and waiving fees. However, this environment presented other challenges for the U.S. banks. Low short-term and long-term rates are putting pressure on revenue growth, and we think that despite the near-term loss mitigation efforts, credit costs will ultimately rise. When certain loans roll off of the hardship assistance programs back into repayment and the government stimulus expires. Structurally, we see loan growth headwinds for the industry as well as other sources of credit compete for the same assets. We think that the big banks are better positioned to meet those challenges while the small peers will likely continue to consolidate.